um, come on up and um, while they're coming, a parent-child dedication, let me make this completely and crystal clear. This is not a salvation act. This is a dedication later on, but Hannah uh, dedicated Samuel, her son, to the Lord. And then we see in the New Testament bringing Jesus to the temple on the eighth day as was instructed. And so I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture. That's okay. I'll be preaching in a few minutes, then you can take your nap. <laughs> well, that's what some of the adults do, so I figured they could do the same. I want to read a few passages of Scripture here from, that you have from God. You can stand a little bit closer. I, I, did, I did take a shower this week. Uh, Psalm, in Psalm 127, I want to read a few verses. Unless one keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift from the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate so and the blessing of God that comes um, the obedience of Christ's earthly parents uh, Mary and Joseph and it records for us in their public intention to live in obedience to God's word Luke 2 verse beginning in verse 22 says and when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed they brought him talking about Jesus as a baby up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every first, firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to us. So again, we see this uh, word of God being obeyed by people of God in their desire to recognize the gift from God that children are. And then later on, the Apostle Paul even distinction in regards to the influence of his mother and his grandmother by faith in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 uh, excuse me chapter 1 verse 5 and all these scriptures are listed in your bulletin inside your bulletin 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 says for us and your mother Eunice and I am sure that it is in you as well and so we have met we have talked through what this process and this commitment era that they have shared with me and so now make this public commitment that it's their desire to love and care for their children according to the biblical direction and values given children in this way. And the scripture even gives us direction for that. From the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So I would ask both sets of parents here today, do you receive this word from the Bible and make this commitment unto the Lord? Yes. Very good. Let me say a word of prayer over them at this time. Made to raise their children in the admonition of your word. I pray that you would bless them in this way, that you alone would be glorified not only in and through them as parents, but into the lives of their children. And God, that you would bring these children to faith in Christ as you use their parents and even extended family. Amen. Now, church, and Jesus said you'll give account for careless words, so don't speak of Christ. Live according to God's word with the purpose of influence to lead them as best we can to faith in Christ. Would you commit to that today? Amen. Very good. So, as a result, I want to pray for us as a church again. And I think in light of what's happened this past week, pray that we, in regards to the lives of unborn children, would eat it clear uh, you can read Psalm 139 if you need more clarity. You can read about the prophet Jeremiah who states that even God called him from his mother's womb for us 
as those who would influence these young lives as a whole. So join me if you would in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we bow before, before you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and we ask that you would use us, those of us today who have made and renewed this commitment to impact the young lives of children for the sake of the gospel. God, I also pray that you would help us bring light to the darkness in our nation in regards to unborn children. Father, we look to you, we cry to you, and we ask for your help in this situation. And God, in all of this, we will trust your faithfulness in line with your word. And we give you thanks and praise, again, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. One other aspect uh, that I have done in my ministry, and I want to do it today, I have written a letter to, is Judith here? Oh, she's over there. That's okay, your parents will get it. I've written a letter to Zoe, and to Judith, and to Michael, and to Mary, and I'm giving them these letters, I'm giving the parents these letters to keep until that day when their children come to faith in Christ, that they will have a record of the fact that their parents committed to lead them in the ways of the Lord, that we as a church committed to help them in their understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also in the letter I wrote, if you're reading this letter, we're rejoicing that you have come to faith in Christ. And so, uh, again, we have talked about all this in advance, but um, here's the letter for Zoe and for Judith. You can put that in their baby books or wherever you want to keep it until that day. And same for Mary and for Michael. And God bless you. I am thrilled. Let's just give God a clap of praise. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Now you can stand up here, but I'm getting ready to preach, so if you can... <laughs> I cannot express enough my great joy in the children that God has blessed Debbie and I with personally, in the mother that God blessed my children with through Debbie, and I take very seriously the admonition of, um, like Psalm 127 said, uh, blessed is the warrior whose quiver is full of them. So we had six. And uh, Samuel, I want to talk about a mother's heart today. But there's a lesson in this walkthrough part of it today. Um, you can go home this week and read it, and read the first part of chapter 2 as well, because we're going to be in this same passage next week. There's so much here. So uh, we will walk through the aspect of a mother's heart that's revealed, but also next week, We'll be looking at the theology from this passage as well. So keep your finger there till next Sunday and you'll be all ready to go when we gather again next week, Lord willing. But uh, I want us to understand how godly people live. And here we see a specific example of a godly mother. And motherhood is very important in the scripture. It's one way that God reveals himself and changes lives for his sake. My own mother, who is still living, is one of those prayer warriors, women of grace, who has greatly and still clear picture as well of a godly mother's heart in the text that we're going to be reading. And I want us to know that God is always working and at work long before we see any results. You'll see that in our text as well. So I trust that we'll look to God as I read verses 9 through 11 in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and there we go, maybe. We can, okay, Jocelyn, you're going to have to help me. This, this little clicker, I can't get it to work. If you'll advance to the next slide for me, I would appreciate it. So we'll be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. If you're using one of the Bibles in the chair pocket there in front of you, it's on page 266. So 1 Samuel Chapter 1, you listen as I read verses 9 through 11. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, Your servant, 
but will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the day. God allows us a peek into the life of one of his people in Old Testament times. And the background was that Hannah was not able to have children up to this point, even though she and her family went annually to sacrifice and to worship to the Lord. It was a great burden upon her. And I think that's the first indicator of a mother's heart is that desire to have that child. And yet you can have a mother's heart even if you've not birthed a child. We see that in the incredible picture of adoption. I am amazed at the families, the moms that will adopt a child of whom she didn't labor for. And when I say labor, ladies, I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that really is the picture of God's family. Do you realize none of us are born into God's family? Your physical birth didn't put you in God's family. The New Testament uses that concept of adoption. We, through faith in Christ, are brought into God's family as believers in Jesus Christ. So we see this picture throughout Scripture. And today I want us to see specifically from Hannah's life that Hannah was hurting. Hannah had a mother's heart that was hurting. And in seeing this, we see it in not only the text we read, but if you have a true mother's heart, heart burden. Even when things are going well with your children, moms, do you bear that burden? That you, have, you, you bear that burden. In Proverbs chapter 14, the Bible tells joy. And for you as mothers who are here today, and some of you may still be bearing a burden for a child. I hope you heard the words of the song that Glenn sang earlier. That your only release is going to come in Christ. And we see that in Hannah. We see that Hannah went right there, that burden alone, because it's akin to Jesus Christ weeping over Jerusalem, as the New Testament records, because he had a desire that they would come to him as Savior. So God knows full well your hurt, your burden that you carry for your children. Verse 8. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? See, he knew being a husband of a woman who had a mother's heart but had not had any children, that her heart was bearing a burden. And this is an illustration of how God reveals that aspect of what we would call a mother's heart from this text, that God uses a mother's heart as an illustration of his great love and his desire for his own people. In Isaiah chapter 49 and Isaiah chapter 66, let me read these passages to you. As the prophet Isaiah pours out from the very heart of God, God's desire. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. That's God's word related to that same sorrow, that same burden, and yet that same love for who know a love for your children like no one else except God. I know that's the case. I've seen it time and time again. So God uses what he knows your heart is since prophet Isaiah again in chapter 66 verses 12 and 13. One whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. God's straying people as he's bringing through the prophet Isaiah a message of comfort that will eventually come and we know ultimately that's pointing to Jesus Christ. He says just as a mother can hold and care for and comfort a child. So too, that's God's desire for you. And you've all seen it. I need not give illustration other than to remind you, you've seen that baby who no matter how disturbed or out of sorts or crying or whatever the situation, that once mama gets a hold of that baby, it's like, 
nothing's happened. You've seen it, haven't you? That's God's desire for his people. That he comfort and care for us as we surrender to him. And so we see these illustrations by the very prophet of God speaking on God's behalf. Of the tenderness, of the depth, of the care, and of the concern. This is such a powerful imagery. Because there's no love and no comfort on earth like God's. And God chooses to compare that to the love and comfort of a mom. What a gracious God we serve. And just like those of you here today as moms, with a true mother's heart, I believe God gave that to you. Because that is how he reveals a portion of himself to this world in which we live. Because again, as a mom, there are times you can mother children that aren't even your own. Have you found that to be the case? Yes. And I've experienced that from loving godly women as well. So the focus of a mother's heart is that which reveals God-given qualities. And we see it in this text. If you'll advance the slides one more, please, Jocelyn. Where in verse 8, we read it just a moment ago, these questions that Hannah's husband asked of her. He said, why do you weep? Why are you sad? And I believe the Bible reveals to us that hers was a heart that was hurting. I mentioned it earlier. Moms, probably no heart experiences hurt like yours does. And I don't know if your mom was this way, but sometimes, I know it's hard to imagine, when I would mess up when I was growing up, I would have rather my mother beat me with a stick than to just give me that disappointed look. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you moms are shying very wryly at this point, and I'm wondering, I think you know exactly what you're doing. Because through that look, I could sense not only her disappointment, but the depth of sorrow that she couldn't believe one of her own children. And I've told, believe me, I have confessed and told my mom time and time again, Mom, it's not your fault I've done some of the things that I've done. And so Hannah's husband asked, why are you weeping? And it's because she hadn't had a child yet, but it's also because that sadness based upon not having a child was her heart of desire that to have a child, she would so love and nurture that child in the same way that God would. He asks, why do you not eat? And I believe it's revealed to us in this passage that a mother's heart is far from thinking of her own well-being first. Moms, I don't know how you do it. I can't think of anything that's kept me from eating. But moms, I know you have borne a burden and carried a hurt that wouldn't even allow you to think of yourself first because of the godliness of a mother's heart you were so concerned Again, for a child or even for someone else. And God has given you that as a way that your heart is prioritized and in line with God's desire for his people. And then the last question he asked, am I not more than ten sons? In the culture, a woman who would have had ten sons would have been seen as extremely blessed by God. We know that's not the case as we understand the fullness of scriptural theology. But Hannah, having not had any children, when her husband says, am I not more to you than ten sons? Chapter 1 says he gave her double portions of everything that he had. He poured as best as he knew how his love out upon Hannah. But it was of no comfort to her. Because it didn't fulfill the desire of that godly mother's heart that she had. And the sense of inability or loss for a mother's heart is never quenched with any type of replacement. There is no replacement for a mom 
and especially a mom who is hurting or has lost. And so today, moms, we recognize your hearts are special. And I want to point out, your mother's heart is needed. We live in a day and age where you need to truly reveal the comfort and love of God like only you can to people who are hurting. But so I also want us to see the idea that a mother's heart is a way that God influences children and others. And who knows where our world would be without godly moms. It's in a bad way now. But can you imagine how much worse it would be if there were not godly moms living under the influence of God and impacting the lives that God has brought into their world? And so here's why I want the rest of us to learn the lesson. If you'll advance that one more time. A mother's heart. This is a lesson for all of us. Because even in the midst of her hurt, even in the midst of her desire, chapter 1 explains that when Eli saw her praying, she was praying with such great distress. Her lips were moving, but there were no audible words coming out. And he thought she was drunk. And when he approached her about it, she said, No, I am just in such deep sorrow. But I want you to see the depth of this sorrow in a mother's heart. It's where the rest of us can learn this lesson. And the reason Eli the priest saw her is because she was in the gathering place of God's people. That's important. She was in the gather. She had gone to make the sacrifice that was required. She had gone to praise and worship the Lord. And at that point, she was praying out of such a burdened heart that Eli the priest knew there was something up. He thought she was drunk when it was the exact opposite. She was worshiping. She was worshiping. And here's where the lesson hits every one of us. And our heart is the key. That meant no matter who you are, a mom, a dad, a child, your heart is made to worship God. And anything shy of that, short of that, or outside of that, you will continue to bear a burden. Because God created you to worship Him. Revelation chapter 4, 11 makes it perfectly clear. He created everything, and everything was made to praise Him. And that's where we all walk away, with this lesson of understanding that Hannah's heart was pouring, Hannah's prayer was pouring out of her heart before God. Verse 19 even indicates how committed they were to worship. Verse 19 says, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. It is clear that Hannah and her family had hearts that were directed towards God and seeking Him. And that her release, her release when she left that place that day, the rest of chapter 1 records for it. And Jocelyn, if you could advance the slide one more time. Her release came as a heart that was impacted by grace. The Old Testament word favor here is what would be the comparable word for grace in the New Testament. But even more than that, even more than that, this idea of being able to walk away, having brought her burden to the Lord, and being able to leave it there in a time of praise and prayer and worship, I want you to know that your heart is going to be the greatest barometer of where you are in relationship to God. And when your heart worships, or maybe I should say, if your heart can worship, will be the greatest indicator of how that relationship is going. That even in the midst of the despair, Hannah was still worshiping God. I know there are those in this room today who are carrying some serious burdens. Worship God through the burdens. Here's the great thing we know about God. That may not change your circumstance. But it'll help you once again realize that God is faithful. 
That's why he's the God who deserves to be worshipped. And Eli, in responding to what he saw of what Hannah was taking, what was Hannah was doing in these prayers that were beyond being audible, yet he could see that there was something going on. He said, "Let your servant find favor in your eyes." That word "favor" is the comparable word to grace in the New Testament. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. You realize she walked away still not having a child. But she walked away having sensed and known the grace and the favor of God and was then able to move on. Same burden, different perspective. Because she truly worshipped God. God will never change. God is worthy of our worship. And that's where our hearts need to be focused, whether things are going good or whether things aren't going good. And the irony here in the passage, it will not take the time to dig into the original language, but the irony here is that Hannah's name means woman of grace. That's the meaning of her name in the original language. And she was graced. She was favored as a result of surrendering through prayer and deciding to praise and worship God in spite of her circumstances. And she was graced. She was favored. And so this morning, I want to encourage you with that. And that's the part that applies to all of us. Is our heart committed to the Lord in worship? in spite of whatever we're going through. Spoiler alert, she did have a child. We'll talk more about that next week. But today, today my challenge before you that I think we see from the word of God is the fact that she was able to pray and praise and worship and stayed committed in her relationship with the Lord even in the depths of of what she was going through. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. And God, I know that today, in the midst of the burdens that are being born and the 